Okay, well, greetings, everyone, and welcome. Um, and thank you all so much for coming early this Friday morning. Um, I'm so excited to introduce what is promised to be a very exciting conversation on mobilizing faith and changing social norms for women and girls. Um, a quick note, so this event is being live streamed, and so we also welcome our online guests as well. Um, my name is Camille Henderson. I am a graduating Masters of Divinity student at Candler School of Theology at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Yes, ma'am. Um, and I also serve as a graduate assistant for the Human Rights Program at the Carter Center, also in Atlanta. Um, and so the Carter Center was founded in 1982 by former United States President Jimmy Carter and former First Lady Rosalind Carter. Um, and the center has helped to improve the quality of life for people in more than 80 countries. The center is committed to advancing human rights and alleviating unnecessary human suffering. And so as I was walking over here this morning, I was thinking that you know we have the distinct pleasure to uh, have this panel and to interact with community and religious leaders alike. And personally, as a uh, woman of clergy preparing for full-time ministry, I was thinking that there's this element of divine calling with religious leaders. Um, we have a responsibility to serve not only God, but also God's people. And this element of serving the community of faith um, is somewhat incomplete without addressing the needs of the beloved community. Um, and so I'm really excited today to engage. We have several conversation partners here who understand that responsibility of serving uh, not only God, but the community at large, the beloved community, in addressing the human rights of women and girls. And so our conversation partners for the hour, um, we have Molly Melching to my immediate left. Um, Molly is the founder of Toastan um, and former CEO, uh, a position that she has held for the past 27 years. And she has recently transitioned to a new role serving as creative director of Toastan, where she continues to give voice on programming and training. And Molly will uh, give more information about Toastan later on in the conversation. Uh, to my immediate right, we also have Sadiat Onike Aziz. Um, she is here representing NASFAT. It is a religious organization with its headquarters in Nigeria. Um, and it's missioned to developing an enlightened Muslim community nurtured by a true understanding of Islam. Um, also, on the very end, representing Nasrat, we have Omam uh, Onike Abdulaziz. Excuse me. Um, Omam, Imam Anike also serves as the chief imam of NASFAT worldwide. Um, and in this capacity, he is responsible for about 1,000 imams, as well as 300 branches of NASFAT, totaling to more than 1 million members worldwide. And so now I'd like to turn it over to Laura, um, who is the director of the Human Rights Program at the Carter Center in Atlanta. Thank you, Camille, and thanks to all of you for joining us today here in the room and also online. Uh, I would like to briefly introduce the Carter Center's Mobilizing Faith for Women and Girls initiative. The goal of the Mobilizing Faith for Women and Girls initiative is that leaders and believers of major faiths and beliefs actively work to end human rights abuses of women and girls and promote equality and opportunity. This initiative builds on President Carter's long commitment since he was president of the United States, to the advancement of human rights of women and girls. His 2014 book, A Call to Action, Women, Religion, Violence, and Power, articulates many of his proposals, including the engagement of religious leaders in this work. The primary contribution of the Carter Center towards achieving this goal is in supporting the participation of religious and community leaders from Ghana and Nigeria to the Tostan training program. We are so very lucky to have with us here today Molly Melching, the founder of Toastan, to explain how the Toastan training inspires and initiates community-led advancement of the rights of women and girls. And as enhanced for our participants, this training focuses on the linkage between religion and human rights. The Carter Center is encouraged to see that over the last two years, this initiative has activated influential individuals within large networks. These individuals include moms, 
chiefs and women leaders who have applied the Tostan method to conduct human rights education programs and to align Islamic teachings and human rights. We are extremely privileged to have with us today two of our partners from Nigeria, Imam Oniki Abdul Aziz and Sadiqe Onike Aziz, who will tell us about their experiences and projects. What I can say is that in my discussion with Tosan alumni, they have reported a significant broadening in their conceptualization of how to solve problems in their communities. As one young lady from Ghana who participated the, to the Tostan Carter Center training expressed to me, I don't have to be a politician to develop my community. Tostan participants return home and began training others in the community on human rights. In addition to conducting human rights training and education programs, Tostan participants have returned home and implemented pilot projects that demonstrate these human rights concepts, projects they undertook inspired by their Tostan participation. For example, they've helped widows and other women gain financial independence and generated community-wide commitments to eliminate obstacles to girls' education. The Carter Center's Mobilizing Faith for Women and Girls initiative provided a small seed grant to the community groups that participated to toast on in order to facilitate these initial projects. We believe, due to toast on's unique ability to inspire and sustain community-based change, and the dedication and motivation and determination demonstrated by our partners who are committed to bettering their communities, the potential exists to impact many people beyond those who the Carter Center directly sponsors, aiming ultimately to facilitate change of social norms and to bring about equality between men and women. Thank you, and I'll turn it back over to Camille. So thank you, Laura, for that um, introduction. And so uh, we have a brief video that we will show. No video, so I'll allow Molly to explain it herself. <laughs> I'll turn it over to Molly. Um, thank you very much, Camille. And it is a great honor to be here this morning with all of you. Um, I don't know if you know or have heard of Tostan, but we are a non-governmental organization founded in 1991 and located in Dakar, Senegal. Uh, we are in Senegal, but we are also working and have worked in eight African countries in both East Africa and West Africa, and are particularly working now in Senegal, Gambia, Guinea, Guinea-Bissau, Mali, and Mauritania. We work in the most remote and uh, resource poor communities of all of these countries. And we particularly work with girls and women who have never been to school and have often dropped out, often because uh, they were forced to marry. Our empowering program is organized in each community by a local facilitator who has gone through extensive training in their own language. Always, we work in 22 national languages. And these facilitators provide the information and the skills that people need to lead and sustain their different development initiatives. It is a holistic program, which has led to many areas and the results of literacy, women and youth leadership, improved community health, and economic empowerment also. But I think Tostan is probably best known for our results in ending female genital cutting and child marriage through our empowering human rights-based program. Act to date, 8,426 communities in eight African countries have publicly declared their intention to abandon these harmful practices based on a process of what Tostan calls values deliberation. This is a process whereby community, community members identify their deeper values and their vision for the future, and then together decide what practices um, actually help them to achieve those goals or may hinder them in achieving these goals. So we introduce human rights and responsibilities and over a, really a three to four month period there is long discussion on each of the human rights principles by aligning them with the basic um, principles of their religion, whether it be Christianity or Islam. 
And they soon realize how, how critical this is in making decisions. Decisions that lead to really deep and important social transformation. It is through this discussion and deliberation that people they decided to abandon these practices which have harmed and even led to the death of many of their daughters. The participants constitute a, um, a core group of educated citizens, men, women, youth, religious and traditional leaders who themselves reach out to their extended family and their social networks, advocating for health and well-being. It's a very positive movement. It is not a blame and shame, oh, this is awful, this is terrible, what we were doing. No, it's about where we want to be in the future and what we need to move forward to achieve a future of health and well-being. And because of this, hundreds have, uh, have joined this growing grassroots movement for social transformation in their own country and have even gone across borders. Because of the positive results that Tostan has had in ending social norms through a human rights approach, and particularly those which constitute abuses against girls and women, um, the Carter Center invited members of the Tostan staff and Islamic rights experts with whom we collaborate to participate in the Human Rights Defenders Conferences in Atlanta, Georgia. These seminars were incredibly inspirational for Tostan as we learned how former President Jimmy Carter had decided to vote his life, the rest of his life, to encourage religious leaders to be at the forefront of a movement to end these abuses against girls and women around the world. I will never forget when I heard him declare, every generic religious text encourages believers to respect essential human dignity. Yet some selected scriptures are interpreted to justify the derogation or inferiority of women and girls, our fellow human beings. We are calling on all those with influence to challenge and change the harmful teachings and practices in religious and secular life that justify discrimination against women and to acknowledge and emphasize the positive messages of equality and human dignity. Our participation in these Carter Center seminars eventually led to a very important collaboration for us by inviting religious leaders and other influential leaders to attend a more in-depth Tostan seminar, which we had been organizing previously for NGO leaders, traditional and religious leaders, and other influential persons uh, in the countries where we work. So these 10-day seminars started in 2015. Uh, in order for Tostan to share our community empowerment program content, our human rights approach, our participatory methodology, our strategies for social norm change, and the theories that underpin our model with visits to communities which had been through the program. We had initially planned on only doing two seminars a year, one in French and one in English, but we soon had requests from many countries and organizations to implement more, and to date, we have organized 14 trainings for 303 participants from 38 different countries. Four of these trainings were specifically organized for religious leaders and influential leaders from Ghana and Nigeria, who had been collaborating with the Carter Center for several years. The seminars are led by Tostan's Islamic rights specialist, whose name is Imam Mohammed Sharif Job. He has spent many years working with Tostan in communities across West Africa to align human rights principles with the basic principles from the Quran. These seminars have been so successful that Tostan has now decided to organize the religious leader seminars, actually, before we even start our community empowerment program in all the communities in which we work. This has led, these seminars have led to these religious leaders who once were hesitant, reticent, and often hostile to our work on human rights, it has led them to become engaged, very engaged, traveling across the country, going to other communities, giving, some, um, giving sermons in the mosque on Friday, 
uh, talking at baptisms and marriages, uh, and often taking the lead, really, in ending such practices as female genital cutting, child marriage, and violence against girls and women, as well as promoting girls' education, women's participation in family and community decisions, and even actively supporting women to run for local office. But instead of explaining the results from these trainings, I would now prefer to let the two wonderful and dynamic participants in one of these Carter Center trainings uh, from Nigeria to explain their experiences um, with you. Thank you. So as Molly said, we are so honored to have um, two representatives from NASFOT uh, to give uh, personal accounts of uh, their time with Tosin and then also their work in the community from uh, a firsthand experience. So I would like to introduce uh, you to Sadiat Onike Aziz. Thank you, Carmel. Thank you, everybody, for being here and those at home. NASFAT's collaboration with the Carter Center has exposed NASFAT members to a lot of opportunities. It has created an awareness of the correlation between Islam and human rights. Most Muslims feel that there is no link between human rights and Islam. And grossly, this is a misconception. Because if you look at Islam and all the objectives of Sharia, Islam, you say, is human rights, and human rights also is uh, Islam. Uh, the training at Tostan, sponsored by the Qatar Center, has brought in our knowledge and exposed us to the realization that human rights is a part of Islam, and Islam, too, is a part of human rights. The objective of Sharia portrays this as um, uh, a, a, a religion that removes harm from the society and promotes benefits. So whatever will harm the society will be removed, and whatever will promote good things for the society is what the religion emphasizes. And a notable scholar of Islam, Ibn Qayyim al jawzi emphasized this when he said, the foundation of Sharia is wisdom and the safeguarding of the people's welfare in this life and the next. In its entirety, it is about justice, mercy, wisdom, and good. Every rule which replaces justice with injustice, mercy with its opposite, the good with mischief, and wisdom with folly, it is a ruling that does not belong to the Sharia, even though it might have been claimed to be according to some interpretations. Islam protects the rights of men, women, children, plants, animals, all the creatures of God, all the creatures of Allah are protected. If you look at the verses of the Quran and the Hadith of the Prophet, all point to the fact that Islam protects the right of all creatures of Allah. As the Prophet himself will tell his companions, will tell mankind, tell people, that be good to your women, for I am the best to my wives. So he emphasizes this a lot to show that people should show mercy to their wives, should show goodness, treat their women well, and should not abandon or um, treat their women. So Islam protects the rights of men, protects the rights of everybody. The women of Nasfat have been exposed to the training on human rights, and this has made them to resolve never to allow anyone trample upon their rights. Now they can rise up against anyone who wants to discriminate against them for whatever reasons. So before this program, I was in a workshop sponsored by the Carter Center. This workshop, we came up with flyers carrying short messages, carrying, uh, showing quotations from the Quran and Adit of the Prophet to support the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So all the 30 articles were portrayed, supported by uh, Quranic um, quotations to teach people, to let Muslims in the world know that Islam is human rights and human rights is Islam. That because human rights, most of the time you find the advocate coming from the West, this makes Muslims to be jittery and feel it doesn't have any link with uh, Islam, with uh, Muslims. But really, if you look at Islam and look at uh, the religion, the text, everything shows that Allah has protected the rights of all his creatures, women, men, even plants and animals are protected in Islam. 
So Nigerian women are hardworking. They are hardworking women. But the problem in the country is that of poverty. And this has affected a lot of activities of women in Nigeria. So generally, because of the training, we went to our chosen, sponsored by the Qatar Center. We, uh, our projects, we picked the um, widows. Because if you look at the problem in the country, basically that population that is affected most of the women population are the widows. In Nigeria, when a man dies, the wife is taken through a lot of problems, a lot of harrowing experiences. Some of them are chased out of their homes. Some of them are stigmatized as husband killers. Some of them even lose their jobs due to the fact that they have to move away from where they were living to rural areas where they can find a uh, means of livelihood. So in the process, you find some of them not being able to sponsor their children through school. Some, their children drop out of school because of that. So as a result of this problem, we chose the widows as the pilot projects we embarked on after the Tostan training on community-led development and human rights. So the Qatar Center gave us a grant of $1,000, which we used to empower eight widows. And along the line, we got a donor to who gave us 750,000 Naira, which is about $2,000. We used to um, empower 12 more widows. And also the um, Lagos State Governor's wife, in celebration of the Widows Day in June 2017, also empowered five widows. So the 25 widows all together were exposed to different trainings on how to groom their business successfully, how to keep records generally. So these helped and with their awareness of their right, they were able to fight for their rights. And at the end of six months, it was all success stories. These widows could stand up to anyone, whether they are in-laws or anybody in the society that tries to trample upon them. And they came up with success stories that for after six months, they were able to groom a business, which helped them to have that economic power, to be able to send their children to school, to be able to feed their children well. Because most of them, you find people living well before, because the husband dies before, the problems they are facing. Their children no longer eat well, their children out of school. So now, after the program, they could feed their children well, get them back to school. Even some got their children to better schools that they were attending before. So basically, all this has been the feedback we have got from the widows. And the widows, all the time, they're always full of prayers for President Carter, for the Carter Center. They're always full of prayers for NASPAT as an organization that linked them up and brought them to light on their right and the rest. And even the group members, those that went for the Carter Center training, uh, the Tostan training, and came back and embarked on the project. So also, in alienating the problem of the widows concerning stigmatization and the rest, we engage our NASPA imams in uh, um, NASPA mocks where the Juma service, the Juma congregation prayer on Fridays are being heard. Here, the imams are made to enlighten the populace, enlighten the community, teach them that they should care for widows, they should love widows, show them love and not deprive them of their means of livelihood whenever the husband dies, and they should show love to their children too and take care of them. So this has helped a lot. So for this year, the Qatar Center has given NASFAT another opportunity to take 30 women to the Tostan training. So these women are drawn from um, 10 different zones in Nigeria because we have NASA branches all over the world, Nigeria, West Africa, and other parts. So these zones are drawn from 10 zones in Nigeria. So by the time they come back from the training, they're also going to embark on projects which they are going to do to solve problems of women within their community. So by the time we do this and other opportunities come, we feel women in rural areas, women in different parts of Nigeria will get to know their rights, will get to stand up and fight for their rights, and will get to be empowered in different ways to face the challenges of everyday life. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sabia. Uh, to also uh, give uh, voice and perspective, we also have Imam Onike, Abdul Aziz. Welcome everybody to this session. I thank you for finding time to be here. First and foremost, let me introduce NASFAT to you. NASFAT 
is an Islamic organization with its headquarters in Lagos. It has well over 300 branches and over 1 million members all over the world. Nasrat has a university by the name Fountain University, a university licensed by the federal government of Nigeria. The university has been in operation in the last 10 years, and we have turned out seven sets of graduates. As a matter of fact, by God's grace, Nasrat is the foremost Islamic organization in Nigeria today. Recently, UNICEF gave us a grant of $116,000 for a campaign to end violence against children. Our liaison with the Qatar Center started about two and a half years ago, and since then, it has grown from leaves and bonds. It has been success stories all over. We collaborate in two areas, the area of training and the area of community-led development. On that training, what do we do? We expose women and girls to their rights and make sure the imams are involved. When we do this, we use the scriptures, juxtapose it with the articles of the UMAN, uh, UDHR, and let them see that religion of Islam supports their rights. We notice a problem, and we said, no, this will not be allowed to continue. And what is that problem? Problem of people trying to use scriptural provisions to deny women and girls their rights and make Islam look anti-women. We saw it as a problem, a fundamental problem. All of you know the influence of religious leaders. When they talk, people listen. We, now, we, were, we folded our hand until the opportunity came. We got our motivations from three sources. Number one, the saying of our noble prophet, when he says, if you see any bad thing, correct it with your hand. If you are not capable, correct it with your tongue. If you are not capable, correct it with your heart. But that is the weakest of all faiths. We got another inspiration from the statement credited to Ahab Bernard, who says, the ignorance of the oppressed is the strength for the oppressor. The ignorance of the oppressed is the strength for the oppressor. If the oppressed doesn't know his right or her right, the oppressor will continue to get motivation, continue to oppress him. Number three thing that gave us motivation was the exposure we got at Tostan Training Seminar Program in Senegal, courtesy of the Qatar Center. Nasfat, you will forever be grateful to the Qatar Center and Tostan. There, we were made to appreciate the nexus between Islam and all the 30 articles of Universal Declaration of Faith, uh, human rights. People will say, why are religious leaders involved in just comparing religious, religious texts with human rights? Why not just teach women their rights? We realize that there are so many misconceptions flying around. Misconception about FGC, people feel that it is a religious obligation, not knowing that it's a cultural obligation. Because we are humans and people listen to us, we go into the scripture and let them know that people take whatever they want from the scriptures. A lot of people speak to the text instead of allowing the text to speak to them. If you pick any scripture, it is your mindset that will determine what you get from it. Some people are doing it ignorantly. Some people are doing it deliberately to continue to oppress women. And I say, no, we will expose women to their rights and we use scripture for that. For this, for what we have achieved so far, I will employ 5W, 1H, and 1T model to, uh, to analyze our results. What is that, the first W? What is the problem that we met on ground? Is it the problem of people using scriptural provisions to justify their oppression of women? Why that problem? Problem people hide under ignorance, and people do it deliberately by getting to the text and continue to oppress women. They will say women could not be leaders, women could not speak in public, women could continue to be mutilated. We now tell them the scripture, the lawgiver has an objective, and the objective of the lawgiver is to make, to remove harm and promote benefit. He says he has sent the Holy Prophet as a blessing to the mankind, and we know our God is not the God of confusion. We now look at that problem and we look at the scripture, we compare it with the articles of human rights, and our people are getting aware, they are getting educated. How do we do it? We organize periodic training for our women, for our youth leaders, and for our imams. When, when we want to do anything that has to do with medical, like FGC, we invite a gynecologist. 
who will give the eighth implication of FGC, why we support it with the scriptural provisions. We do that regularly for our imams. We do that regularly for our youth leaders, the ladies leaders. We do that regularly for our women leaders. Where do we do that? Nasfat has a lot of Friday mosques all over the world. We have mosques in the US, we have in the UK, we have in Netherlands, we have in Congo, we have in Gabon, we have in Egypt. We encourage our imams to continue to make it point of education, to make it reference point, to educate members on the right of women, and they should just oppose it with the scriptural provisions and the articles of the human rights. Also, we meet all Nasfa members, we meet every Sunday all over the world. We call it Asalatu. We call it, some people call it Sunday Fellowship. On this, uh, uh, in this forum, we encourage our people to know what Islam says about the right of women and the right of, and the right of ladies. How often do we do this? We organize structured training. We, anytime we have opportunity of gathering, we make sure we encourage women to know their rights. Then what has been the impact of this thing? We have succeeded in getting attitudinal changes, behavioral changes, confidence building, commitment and resolution from our women and our women and girls, not to ever cut their female children. A ready example was the demonstration of the training there, the confidence were built in them by one of the participants. The publicly challenged an Islamic scholar who was trying to buttress his point by picking something from, from the scripture to show that women could not speak in public. This woman came out, collected the microphone, and challenged that leader that no, we have been told that women could speak in public. It's the only thing that, the only thing is that there's a way she to speak in public. Nobody can deny women of Nasfat, ladies of Nasfat, they are right in terms of the exposure that God has given them. We have resolved three things. We have let people know that Nasfat will never allow anybody to hide under scriptural provision to deny women and girls their rights. We are, we are shouting on top of our voices that Islam is human rights. Human rights is Islam. Number three, we have made our people to understand that if the noble prophet was a, could be a member of a human rights group, that human rights group was called Ilifol Ifudul. It was in existence before the prophet became prophet. When I became prophet, he said, there used to be a human rights group called Ilifol Ifudul when I was not a prophet. If that group should come up again, I will join that group. <laughs> that shows that anybody who had under scriptural provision that he has decided to misinterpret himself to deny women their rights, that person will never be allowed to have a voice in Nasrullah in fact in Nasfat. And we do that regularly. This coming Sunday, the lecture point in all our locations will be can a woman speak in public? And we have got evidence from the Quran, evidence from the text of the prophet that women were speaking in public during the time of the prophet. They were leaders during the time of the prophet. They were doing a lot of things that men do during the time of the prophet. We thank the Qatar Center once again. We thank the Toaster. We cannot thank you enough for the kind of exposure we are, we, are giving, we are giving us. We realize that most NGOs, they don't engage religious leaders in this campaign. And the only people, the, only, the set of people that you engage to change the perception of people about women, about gays, are the religious leaders. We with a lot of influences. We have the connectivity, the respect us. Qatar Center saw the opportunity, they jump parties, and that it has been success stories since 2015. We thank you once again, and we want to play all over this that we want more. <laughs> thank you, Imam Onike. Um, and so at this time, I'd like to open the floor up for questions, both from the audience, and then engage in conversation with our panelists as well. Um, as we are generating questions in our minds, um, I do want to bring back this notion of, Imam Oniki, you were talking about the fact that we sometimes speak to the text, to the sacred text, rather than allowing the text to speak to us. And I know that both with the Quran and then also in various religious contexts, myself being in the Christian context, and then also with the Hebrew Bible, there is this issue of, or this, this concept of um, allowing the text to summons us. Um, and 
given that we have the proper framework of interpretation um, that uh, these texts would then teach us or show us or summons us or build in us a way to know truth and light. Um, and so I wonder, how is it that one would go from speaking to the text to allowing the text to speak to them? Thank you so much. There are fundamental things that one will need to learn before preaching in Islam. That's what we call the principles of Islamic jurisprudence. And the second one is called Makosi de Seria, the objective of Islam, the objective of the lawgiver. We adapt a particular material prepared by Islamic Education Trust and Dawah Institute of Nigeria. If you don't have this knowledge, if you pick any scriptural book, your mindset will determine what you get from that book. But if you have the foundation knowledge that the objective of the lawgiver is to make this, go this world a better place for everybody. Once you know the objective, if you are reading the text and it's giving you contrary meaning, you will know that something is wrong with your understanding of that scripture. And that is the basis, that is the foundation, that is the kind of training we give our people in Nasbah, that first of all, before you open any scripture, understand the objective of the lawgiver, which is the promotion of benefits and removal of arms. But more often than not, even some people when they kill, they want to justify that killing by opening the scripture and reading out of context. With the kind of exposure we are giving our women and youth leaders, and ladies leaders in Nasbah, if you quote anything from the Quran, you quote anything from the text of the prophet, they will correct you instantly because they have the foundation. And the foundation is that God will never allow any other creature to oppress any other, any other being. That is the foundation. That is the objective of the Sharia. And that is what Sadia has quoted the other time, the statement by Ibn Okoyim Ajaziya, that whatever move from good to bad, whatever move from justice to injustice, whatever move from benefit to harm, is not part of Islam. Even if you try to quote, to justify it by quoting from the text. First of all, we encourage our members to have that knowledge. That knowledge that the objective of Islam is benefit. And it does it, there's an Islamic principle that says arms must be eliminated. If you are inflicting arms on, 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 on female children by cutting them into pieces in the name of culture, in the name of religion, that has run contrary to the teaching of Islam. Once you have the foundation knowledge that arm must not be inflicted on your fellow human being, no matter the way, no matter the color, no matter the face of that arm, you cannot justify it using the scripture of Islam. And that is why we continue to thank the Qatar Center for giving us the exposure in terms of UDHR knowledge. While we have the knowledge of the scriptural teaching, we continue to thank you for the opportunity. And we want to take it further in this sort of FGC. I was discussing with Laura the other time that we want to do a questionnaire. Those who have had themselves mutilated in the past, we want to know their experiences. We want to go empirical, give them questionnaire, and they to be anonymous. Were you mutilated? Did you do FGC? What has been your experience in terms of sexual enjoy enjoyment? What did you go through? Because we realized in Nigeria, because of the cultural background, a lot of people will not want to come out publicly to say the kind of torture, to explain the kind of torture, they want to, to explain what they are going through now as a result of FGC. But basically speaking, you are succeeded in achieving five things. Behavioral changes, attitudinal changes, confidence building, resolution, and commitment from our women and leaders, and that's a great success. There has been a paradigm seek. All of them, it's on video. All of them resolved after the training. The first training that we did was on the 2nd of May, 2016. 97 ladies attended that program and about 200 imams. After the training, they resolved that never will they mutilate their female children. That is a, that is a great success for Nasfat and will forever be grateful to the Star and the Qatar Center for all. We didn't put any gun on their head. They just said, having been exposed to the religious aspect of it, that is cultural, it has nothing to do with religion. Having been exposed to the health implication of it by a renowned gynecologist in Lagos State, a consultant with the Lagos State University Teaching Hospital, we invited her. 
Come and give them the health implication. So give them the health implication. Why we give them the religious implication? And they listen to two authorities in that area. Why won't they be confused? At the end of the day, they resolved that they will never mutilate their own female daughters, female, female children. We thank you once again to the Qatar Center. Express our gratitude to President Qatar. May God preserve his life. <laughs> Um, and so I want to ask uh, Sadiat as well, if you can speak to, um, in working with the widows, and also you work with youth as well, um, if there uh, has, if you have acknowledged any way that we interact with the text differently, or specifically in your context with the Quran, um, and, and, and what are some of the things that you have noticed in working with widows and with youth about how we engage in our religious texts and in our religious spaces? Thank you, Carmel. Um, like um, Imam Onike stated, we do trainings for our youth leaders, our women. Every December, we put the women together from all over the country, and we take them through these uh, misconceptions, how people use the text to portray their points on oppressing women. So there, we take them through this training to teach them all the evidences they can use, just like the woman who collected the uh, microphone from the imam that was trying to mislead the congregation. We give them evidences they can use, because it's not just standing up to say, no, this is not true. But you also using the text to tell that what Allah said in the Quran wasn't that women should not talk, but rather that women should not talk seductively in public. So, and that does not equate to do not talk. So, even our youth leaders, we take them through these trainings to let them know with evidences, because if you are quoting or you're saying anything, you should have evidences from the text for you to buttress your point. And they go through this training to do this. And for our widows, that women cannot walk, women cannot own properties, that is not Islam. A man can inherit a woman. If you go to the chapter 4 of the Holy Quran, there you will see how inheritance, how a man can inherit from a woman, how a woman can inherit from a man. If a woman will not work to, have, to own properties, how will she have properties that people will inherit? So these are the evidences we use. That widows should work. They should be empowered. And with available resources, like I mentioned earlier, Nigerian women are hardworking. But what they need, uh, the resources, to be able to give themselves that power to stand up to whoever wants to deprive them of their rights. Even when their husband dies, we, we, we are working on giving them legal, legal backing. Because I know of a, a lady who, when the husband was alive, was doing well with the children. All of a sudden, the husband dies. Six months after, she sent me a text that there was no food her and her children would eat. It, I was so touched that I had to look for some fund to send to her. So with empowerment, with uh, such a woman being empowered, then her children won't have to go hungry. Then she'll be able to stand up even to her in-laws, that even when they want to chase them out of their homes, that she has a right to the husband's property. That the husband, too, through Islamic way, can distribute the property, give the in-laws whatever is due to them, the wife too has a right to inherit, to stay and nurture whatever business the man has. She shouldn't be deprived of this livelihood, that the good life she was living when the husband was alive, all because these in-laws, some of them are selfish, not all, but you have a few, just one or two in the family who will rise up and want to collect everything and chase out the woman. And they do this by stigmatizing the women as the killers of their husbands. So with that, they send them out. They don't care whether they eat, whether the children feed, whether they go to school. So with the empowerment program we have given to those we have given them to, this has strengthened them to be able to stand up against these oppressors and tell them that they have a right. And we have NGOs too now that are going into fighting for their right to ensure that the in-laws don't maltreat them and ensure that their children are in school and even going to good schools that they were going to while their fathers were alive. So the Nasfat youths, women, even imams, some of them get baffled. Oh, you mean human rights is Islam? Islam is human rights? But by the time you give them evidence, it supports these rights that Allah will say he created 
human beings in different colors, different sex, just for us to know ourselves, just for us to live well on land, not because he, he prefers one color to the other, not because an Arab is superior to a non-Arab, not because a white is superior to a black person, but that he created us in different colors out of his own mercy, out of you know, us living together on earth for us to know ourselves. So by the time you, they, you give them these scriptural um, evidences to show that the different colors that Allah has created us in, is out of his own mercy. He has his reason for that, not because one color is superior to the other. So this has helped to let people know that Islam forbids oppression, even to animals. It is stated, even to animals, you are not supposed to oppress them. Even when you want to slaughter them for meat, there are ways Islam has prescribed steps that you have to take to slaughter these animals, to show them mercy to, because they are also living beings. So Islam forbids oppression of women, men, children, in whatever form. And Islam, and Naswat is in forefront fighting for this in Nigeria and the world over. Thank you. My prayer to the audience at home and those who are present here is that Naswat has got the spread. Naswat has got the reach. Nasrat has come of age. If you partner with Nasrat, in whatever program you are doing, be assured that a lot of people will benefit from that intervention. A society that has, had, that has had branches in 300 locations all over the world with about 1 million members that has been recognized by UNICEF to the extent of getting a grant of $116,000, it means you have got the credibility. You have come of age. I implore the NGO, the NGOs, the United Nations itself to embrace NASFAT and partner with us at the Qatar Center as well, and we will never let you down. <laughs> so I did, I wanted to um, uh, ask you, Miley, and I saw that you were writing fever feverishly. Um, it has, what lessons have you learned in working with religious leaders while also working in social development, community development. What have you learned about this intersection of religion and human rights in the work of TOSAN and the work of F FGC? Okay, thank you. Um, uh, you know that when uh, I started TOSAN in 1991, I'd already been living in Senegal for almost 20 years. And the goal of our program was not at all about ending FGC or child marriage. It was just the fact that I had traveled all over Senegal. I was working in a children's center, and we were doing a radio program, and all over I saw how women were living in poverty, and they were just so hungry for information. Most of them had never been to school. Those who had been to school, it was in French, a language they didn't understand that it had a totally different worldview and different values than their own religion and their own culture. And I thought how sad that um, these women did not have access to a, uh, an education which allowed them to come together and to discuss really what their own vision of development was and what their own values were and how they could uh, make sure that as they went through projects, they were educated enough to be able to lead and sustain any projects uh, and also uh, incorporate their values into any kind of decisions they were making. And so um, I did start the, the education program when I lived in a village for three years. I worked with the communities to try to develop a program that would give them the information but also the skills they needed uh, to, to move forward in the ways that they thought uh, they wanted their communities to evolve. So it was in 1995 when we decided that the, the women were just begging us for more information on their own health. And we just said, okay, we're going to do that, but we need to do participatory research before. And we realized that many of the health problems were not even related to a lack of information about health, but they didn't know their right to health, and they didn't know exactly what their responsibilities were in relation to health. So I started researching who's using human rights, and I found that 
the human rights that were being used in 1995 were articles from different human rights instruments that were very academic and the language was very difficult for people in the communities we worked in to understand, it was hard for them to understand. So we came up with principles that came from mostly all the human rights instruments. Uh, and the principles were, were you know, similar throughout. The right to be free from all forms of violence. The right to be free from all forms of discrimination. And we, you know, and we had about 19 really basic principles that we were teaching in a very participatory way through theater, poetry, and song, and dance, and allowing people to express themselves and express what violations were in their community. And we started this program as a pilot, and we started seeing amazing things happen all over the, where we were working, and that was that women were now, as, as people have said, Sadiyad and uh, Imam, that women suddenly started speaking out, not only speaking out, but finding innovative ways to let their voices be heard. When a man beat up his, his wife, she was pregnant, in Jalakoto in southeastern uh, Senegal, the women said, we're going to march. And they said this was very interesting because we, we, we promote a peaceful way forward. Uh, not, you know, aggressive. Not, you know, give us our rights or anything like that, but we all have human rights, men, women, and children. And we will defend those because we also have responsibilities to respect others' rights. So they said we are marching not against men, but against violence. And if the men have d uh, discrimination against them, violence against them, we will support you also. And they started doing this all over the country and speaking out. And we said, wow, human rights are powerful. We were surprised. Eight years of education in the communities in Senegal and uh, hundreds of communities. And we'd never seen this before. And so we said, okay, we're gonna change our whole program. And in 2000, again, the other mistake we made, we had made, we've made every mistake you can possibly make <laughs> in the 27 years. So the mistake we had made was to do women's rights first. When we did the women's health module, we started it out with women's rights. And can you imagine what the reaction was? Uh, the reaction was uh, suspicion on the part of the men, the religious leaders said, what is this, uh, you know? And I, actually, I was the only American in Tostan. It's a 99% it's a African organization. But still, the facilitators, and they said, where are you getting these strange ideas, da, da, da. And we said, okay, we've made a mistake. In 2000, we introduced human rights instead of, of, of women's rights. Men, women, and children, and it changed everything. And then we started working particularly with the religious leaders and saying, um, I mean, we had had strong reactions from the religious leaders previously. Uh, even they had marched against us. I would never forget looking at the hotel when we were up in the very conservative region of Futa in northern Senegal and seeing tires burning and men out there marching against us. And what happened there is that we actually called them in and asked them to sit down for dialogue and saying, you don't understand our program. We are not here to impose. Rather, we are here to inform. You are intelligent. If you feel that this is in contradiction to your basic religious values and principles, we are ready to stop. But what we think is that once you go through this values deliberation, when you understand the basic principles of human rights and the basic principles of Islam and other religions, you will see that they reinforce your religion, not the contrary. And it was then that we started really seeing when we said, we will open classes for you. And they, they then became the leaders of that movement in that area. And we said, okay, we've got to do this more. And so we now really, um, in, it's just been so important. Um, and I think President Carter was right. It, because religion is so influential in this world, if you do not work with religious leaders and go with um, respect, and sometimes people just haven't uh, had this opportunity to do these values deliberations. We haven't sat down and say, what do we really want for the future? What are our deeper values? And it, it, it's the process of doing that and the dialogue with the women, the children, and the religious leaders, the traditional leaders, that has led to so many extraordinary things happening uh, in the countries where we're working. And so we totally 
believe, as Imam has said, that it is something that should be spread not only in Africa. We've also had people from India, Indonesia, Nepal, and um, other countries outside of Africa. We think even America needs that now, too, uh, by the way. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. OK. Do we have question, time for questions from the audience? Are there questions from the audience? Maybe one or two questions? Yes, ma'am. Yes, if you come forward. Um, my name is Bergen, and I'm with an organization called Big Ocean Women, and one of our tenets is that we honor our feminine biology. And so around the, the issues with um, FGC, um, I'm just wondering, are there ways that we can, um, through faith and al also through culture, honor these unique biological feminine experiences like menstruation, um, even like female sexuality and, and orgasm, um, pregnancy, birth, these kinds of really unique fem female experiences that I think are, at least in my life, have been really empowering to me. Um, are there ways that we can empower women and elevate their status in their communities? Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, it will interest you to note that Islam talks about everything. Allah says there's nothing that is not mentioned in the Quran. Sexual activity, orgasm, menstruation, and the rest of it. Let me give you a story. The man that succeeded the prophet, the third person that succeeded the holy prophet, Sayyidina Umar, was passing one day, and he overheard a woman saying, if not because of the fear of God, Umar has sent my husband to war, and I'm feeling I'm missing my husband now. I will have gone into prostitution. Umar heard. Umar could not enter, could not, could not enter the place. He didn't want to intrude into the privacy of that woman. He now went to his own daughter, Afsa, and he asked Afsa, how this lamb is not a religion of sinus. He said, Afsa, for how long can a woman stay without seeing a man? Ah, Afsa said, three months, four months. There and then, he enacted a law that nobody, no man should go out of, the, of his place of abode for more than four months. <laughs> it, was not, it, 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 it was not a woman. He had to seek the concept of a, a woman. That how long, that's why I was, I was talking about witnesses in court. People would think that women are relegated to the background, that it is two to one, that two women is equal, are equal to one man. No, in some instances, the witnesses, the evidences of women are way there than that of men. When you talk about this of menstruation, pregnancy, and the rest of it, don't ask a man. You need to ask a woman. All the things that the woman has asked us, Islam mentions everything. But this forum may not allow us to go into detail. See the extent. When somebody was complaining that my man has not been around for some time, and I'm missing him now, I need to have fun with my man, Umar overheard the woman, but he could not answer. He had to go and meet his own, his own daughter, who happened to be a woman. That For how long can a woman stay without seeing a man? The, the lady was trying to be silent. She said, no, this is not a religion of silence. Tell me. I want to enact a law. And the lady said, I don't think there's any woman who can afford not to see a man for more than four months. Yeah, and then he enacted a law. That no matter what you want to go and do, further for business, for war, for personal transaction, don't leave your home for more than this particular period. If NGOs are ready to collaborate with NESFAT, we have the material to justify, to support all our claims. We have material from other sister organizations like Dawa Institute of Nigeria, who have been our collaborator, to justify all that we are telling you. The call continues to guide us aright. Sadia, <laughs> so, yeah, did you want to comment? Yeah, he, um, to add to a few things to what the imam said, Islam explains everything. That's why Islam is a way of life. Allah has explained everything. If you add the Quran to the hadith of the Prophet, because the Prophet Sallam, was, uh, according to his wife, not an outsider, but the wife telling the people that the Prophet is the working Quran. That is, if you want to see the practical Quran, look at the prophet's life. 
and this was replicated in the lives of all his um, successors after he died, that they were alive to all the problems of the women. That during the time of the uh, prophet, that whenever women have questions to ask concerning issues about them, they go straight to the prophet's house. Sometimes they ask the wife, and the wife will go ask on the prophet. Sometimes they go in straight. Even there was a period when they said the prophet went around telling people, telling women to give charity, that they should give charity. So one of the wives of the companions of the prophet wanted to ask that if the husband does not have enough, can the woman give? So she went to the prophet, and the prophet told her that if you give to your husband, to a family member, you earn two rewards. But if you give to an outsider, you, have, you earn one reward. Why is the one to the family member two rewards? Because the first one is out of charity. You get your reward for that. The second one is that you are tying the ties of kinship. So that makes the one you give to your family member two rewards. So women were open, even concerning issues of menstruation, that when they menstruate their periods at a certain age, they menstruate and menstruation does not stop then at the usual time, that they find elongation of the period. And the Prophet came up with that, OK, at uh, this period, when you count the number of days you have been menstruating normally before, the extra days, you check out for the blood. The blood of menstruation is different from the pure blood in our body. So if the color changes, you know that is no more menstruation. Maybe a vein um, is, uh, uh, got ruptured, and that is what is bringing out the blood. So women were open to go to the prophet to seek answers to whatever problems they have. So in Islam, everything is resolved. Every, every question concerning femininity, concerning women, concerning any issue. And these have been passed down to us now because all these things are written down in hadith. So you have the Quranic verses. You have the hadith explaining how the prophet practically applied the Quran for you to understand the practicality of the, uh, the, the, the rulings God gave, his revelation and everything. And this touches, every, that's why we say Islam is a way of life. It explains everything. There's no question you have in mind that you don't have solutions to. Thank you. Just really briefly just say, yes, thank you, uh, that we were very worried about introducing sexual and reproductive health in our program back way back in 1995. And at a time when people were not at all discussing these issues, not discussing FGC, not discussing child marriage, not discussing menstruation, not discussing menopause. But, because this is one of the questions we got from the participatory research. The women were saying to us, in our, na in our local language, uh, menopause means getting down from the bed. Is, is that the truth? And so... <laughs> so... They said we are often confined to goats and grandchildren. Is this right? You know, and so they wanted to know about this. So we worked, I think the key for us in doing all this work we did on FGC and on all the, uh, the, the, the different phases of development of women, the key to it being successful uh, and it was to go to the religious leaders and say, this is what we're going to do, why we're going to do it, um, women are not aware of their bodily functions, which are normal functions. And from what we have seen with our other religious leaders, there is nothing in here that goes against Quranic teachings. But we want to, when we'd go into a village, we'd say, we want to sit down and work with you and show you everything we want to do. We will not show pictures in public, because that shocks people. We will have what we call envelopes of discretion, where people can together in the groups that they feel comfortable with look at the different parts of the body. We teach all the parts of the body. And after that, then the religious leaders were very much on board with our going into all these details. I'll never forget being at a meeting uh, in front of everybody. A 14-year-old adolescent stood up and actually explained how women get pregnant. And I was, of course, in detail. And I was shocked because I was sitting next to the imam but I had also known that our facilitator and the supervisor had worked with the imam before. He had seen all the sessions. And so she explained how men and women have children in front of the whole audience. And I looked over at the religious leader. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
And I thought, okay. <laughs> because, and then he said, it's important for girls to know this. They have to know this. And they didn't know before, and they were getting pregnant because they didn't know how they got pregnant. And this has led to, we will also work in prisons. You have the high level of infanticide, the people um, in prisons in Senegal because of this, and abortions, leading to abortions because uh, they, they may not have even known, had never had sexual education. And so again, the key is collaboration making sure that the religious leaders uh, understand why you're doing it and how you're doing it in a respectful way. Uh, and they support you. And it's been amazing to have support from the religious leaders all, in all the countries in which we work, which are um, 94 to 95% Islamic. Thank you. I would also, yeah, very quickly, within Protestant Christianity, there is also this concept of the doctrine of creation. And so within feminist and womanist theology, there are writers who have paralleled the fact that God created with the woman's ability to create. And they also engage these concepts of menstruation and sexuality. So for further reading, there are writers that speak to feminist and womanist theology as well. Um, yeah, so we would like to hand it over to Laura to give concluding statements. Thank you, Camille, and thank you to the wonderful panelists. I couldn't help but think of an analogy as I was listening to all of you, and that is perhaps the Carter Center could be considered the kindling. Toast on the spark, but you, Imam Anike, and Sadia, and your work, you are the flame. And we really hope that this fire rages, so, and, it, and that more people join us in feeding this flame. So again, thank you from the Carter Center. It's our um, honor, in fact, to be collaborating with you, and thank you for your continuation of your wonderful work. Uh, again, thank you to Tosan, to NASFAT, and to the Carter Center, and thank you to all of you for joining us today. Thank you. So early. Thank you.